Hi, my name is Scott Simpson, and this is Approach to Cystic Lung Disease on CT. The goals and objectives of this lecture are to develop an algorithmic approach to cystic lung disease on CT, compare and contrast the four most common causes, and then recognize secondary findings that may lead to a more specific diagnosis. Our approach is going to, uh, going to use cases to highlight the four most common causes. These are lymphangiomyomatosis, pulmonary Langerhans cell histiocytosis, lymphocytic interstitial pneumonia, and Berthog du Bain. And then while we go through these cases, it's going to be important that you pay attention to the distribution, shape, and associated findings of these cystic lung diseases to help develop an algorithm at the last part of the lecture. So let's go through some cases. So here's a 48-year-old female with a history of chest pain, and I think we can see that she has a very large uh, right-sided pneumothorax. The patient received the chest CT. We can see a chest tube was placed. And in their lung parenchyma, we can see that there are several cysts bilaterally. You notice these cysts are bilateral and have a uniform shape and size. Also notice that there's some ground glass opacity and consolidation in the right lung. As we come down further, again, we can see that there are several cysts within the lung parenchyma. In her upper abdomen, there was a macroscopic fat-containing lesion in the upper pole of the left kidney. Here's our summary slides. And on our summary slides, again, we can see that there are several cysts within the lung parenchyma that are thin-walled, regular in shape, diffusely, dis uh, diffus diffusely distributed, with this new right lung ground glass opacity and fatty lesion in the left kidney. The lung parenchyma between the cysts is normal, except for this one area. These findings are highly characteristic of lymphangiomyomatosis, with the secondary pneumothorax secondary to cyst rupture, re-expansion pulmonary edema accounted for the ground glass opacity, and an associated angiomyolipoma. Lymphangiomyomatosis exclusively affects women, typically of childbearing years. It's characterized by abnormal proliferation of smooth muscle cells adjacent to um, airways within the lung parenchyma and lymphatics. Um, these people may present with spontaneous pneumothoraces, and ultimately, this is a progressive disease with a poor prognosis. Ultimately, the treatment here is lung transplant. What do we see on CT is the presence of thin-walled cysts. However, these cysts are regular in shape and uniform um, in shape. They're diffusely distributed throughout the lung parenchyma, and the intervening lung is generally normal, the exception in this case being re-expansion pulmonary edema. Associated findings of LAM include chylus pleural effusions, angiomyolipomas that can occur in the liver, kidneys, retroperitoneum, or even the posterior mediastinum, and these abnormal lymphatic fluid collections that can also occur in the retroperitoneum and posterior mediastinum. Here's a 32-year-old female with a mild case of lymphangiomyomatosis. We see that there are several small cysts within the lung parenchyma. Notice these cysts are you know, uniform in shape and size. They have regular thin walls. A 48-year-old female with a history of severe lymphangiomyomatosis. Again, when we look at these cysts, they're fairly uniform in shape, size, and distribution. They affect all portions of the lungs. There's no intervening septations or central dots on that sometimes we see, see with emphysema. And importantly, the intervening lung is normal. Also notice that um, this is a diffuse disease and therefore it will involve the costophrenic angles. This does separate this disease, LAM, from pulmonary Langerhans cell osteocytosis, which often spare these areas. In this person's upper abdomen, we can see that the kidneys are largely replaced by fat-containing lesions characteristic of associated angiomyolipomas. These can occur within the kidneys, liver, retroperitoneum, or posterior mediastinum. Here's a case of a 63-year-old female. You can see that this person has advanced lymphangiomyomatosis. Notice that this can be kind of difficult to differentiate from severe central lobular emphysema. For one, most of these cystic spaces have uh, clearly identifiable walls. Again, we can see that the lower lung zones are affected, but the lung apices are relatively spared. This would be unusual for severe central lobular emphysema, which often affects the lung apices the most. Here's a 48-year-old female with a double lung transplant for LAM in 2002. In 2007, five years afterwards, her CT appeared relatively normal. However, two years after that, we could actually see that she started developing a couple small cysts in the lung bilaterally, resembling her initial case of lymphangiomyomatosis. Three years after that, 2012, we could see that the cysts have increased in size and number bilaterally, but again, are diffusely distributed, uniform in shape and size with normal intervening lung parenchyma. 2017, again, the cysts are increasing in size and number, and this is an example of recurrent lymphangiomyomatosis, which can occur after the patient has received the double lung transplant. Here's a 41-year-old 41 41 -year female with a questionable history of LAM based on CT. I think we can make a confident diagnosis. 
uniformly distributed uh, cysts of shape and size affecting all lung zones. In her upper abdomen, she did have an abnormality adjacent to her psoas musculature. She did have this fluid collection that was kind of elongated. When we see these, this reflects a retroperitoneal lymphatic fluid collection. Lymphatic fluid collections can occur in the retroperitoneum or posterior mediastinum in the setting of lymphangiomyomatosis. This is a 45-year-old man who presented for lung transplant. And on his CT, we can see that there is the presence of a severe cystic lung disease. Notice that he does have several cystic spaces in his lungs with thin walls. He does have a bulla here that should not distract us. We can see that this is probably not central alveolar emphysema as the um, lung apices are relatively spared. This is a cystic lung disease that diffusely affects the lung. This resembles lymphangiomyomatosis. However, this is a man, and so that doesn't fit. However, this person does have uh, myocardial fatty deposits as well as areas of several sclerotic lesions throughout his bones, predominantly his spine, so widespread sclerotic lesions. The key feature here was that he did have subependymal calcifications on a head CT with subcortical white matter changes. These findings are, of course, characteristic of tuberous sclerosis lamb complex. So the tuberous sclerosis lamb complex shares a similar genetic defect, resulting in some overlapping features with lamb. You can see cystic lung disease um, in tuberous sclerosis, though only seen in 30 to 40% of cases, um, as opposed to lamb, where you see um, cystic lung disease in virtually all cases. These are also associated with angiomyolipoma, similar to lymphangiomyomatosis. Distinct features of TS lamb complex include male gender. Um, this occurs in men more commonly as opposed to females for lymphangiomyomatosis. These widespread sclerotic lesions in focal fatty myocardial deposits. These can be confusing when first seen as they can resemble osteoblastic metastasis and these may resemble subendocardial remote infarcts. The next case is a 38 year old man with a chronic dry cough and 18 pack year history of smoking. On a CT, we can see that there are several cysts, thin and thick walled in the upper lung zones. We're gonna see that there are small nodules within the lung parenchyma. Notice that this disease is predominantly confined to the upper lung zones as seen on this coronal CT. Here's our representative CT images. And on the CT images, we can see that there are both thin and thick walled cysts. So this is very different than what we saw on our previous case. We can see that there are some bizarrely shaped cysts within the lung parenchyma, not regular like we saw in lamb. And that there are also several solid and subsolid pulmonary nodules indicating an abnormal lung um, parenchymal abnormality between the cysts, again, different than what we saw with lamb. In addition, we can see that this disease is mainly confined to the upper lung zones with CP angle sparing. Those the lower lung zones are spared. So again, we have numerous thin and thick walled cysts, some are regular in shape that are upper lobe predominant with bays that are sparing and tiny solid and subsolid pulmonary nodules. This is characteristic of pulmonary Langerhans cell histiocytosis. PLCH is nearly associated, universally associated with uh, smoking. This typically occurs between the ages of 20 to 40, and it may present with a spontaneous pneumothorax like LAM. However, some distinguishing clinical features include constitutional symptoms such as fever, uh, night, fever, night sweats, and weight loss. On CT, we see this as an upper lobe predominant disease that spares the costophrenic angles, again, discriminating it from LAM, and that we actually see several findings that progress through each other. Initially, we may see just nodules in the lung parenchyma, both solid and subsolid, typically central lobular in distribution. These nodules then undergo cavitation, resulting in thicker walled cavities in the lung parenchyma. These cavities then may undergo um, excavation and thinner walls, forming these cysts that then may become more confluent, resulting in these bizarrely shaped cysts, possibly with intervening fibrosis, and therefore the intervening lung parenchyma and PLCH is often abnormal. It's important to note that it doesn't go through a uniform progression like this. You often will see bizarrely shaped cysts, thin walled cysts, thick walled cysts, and nodules all in the same image. And again, this is an upper lung zone predominant abnormality. Here's a 44-year-old man with a 22-pack year history of smoking, a key feature, um, who continued to smoke from 2009 to 2012. Blowing up these two areas, we can see the progression of this disease initially starting as areas of cysts and ground glass opacity and nodules. 2012, we can see that the cysts have increased in size and number. The nodules have subsequently resolved, again, turning from nodules to cavities to cysts. Both in 2009 and 2012, we can see that the costophrenic angles are spared. Again, this is characteristic of PLCH. The CP angles are often involved in the setting of LAM. 
Here's a 43-year-old female with an 18-pack year history of smoking. We can see in 2014 that she does have thin and thick walled cysts in her upper lung zones, as well as small nodules, again, characteristic of PLCH. This person did quit after diagnosis in 2016. We see that the nodules and thicker walled cysts have subsequently resolved, though that she did get left with residual cysts in the lung. This is a characteristic feature of PLCH that they could stop smoking. The disease can certainly improve. However, the cysts are permanent and do remain. This is that same person, just lower lung uh, in the mid lung zones. And we can see just how extensive her disease was. We could see that there were numerous nodules, both solid and subsolid, with cystic change in the lung parenchyma. Notice that the um, cysts will persist, but the nodules and cavities will improve after the cessation of smoking in the majority of people. However, you could again note that the CP angles here are spared. Again, this is a characteristic feature of PLCH. No matter how severe the disease is, the CP angles are almost always spared. This is a 46-year-old man with advanced pulmonary Langerhans cell osteocytosis. And we can see that this person now has progressed to these bizarrely shaped cysts, predominantly in the upper lung zones. You should also keep a look out for lung cancers as these are smokers. This person was subsequently diagnosed with a non-small cell lung cancer. Another associated complication of PLCH is the development of pulmonary hypertension. This often drives people to lung transplantation. This person did have a moderate to severely dilated pulmonary artery in keeping with pulmonary hypertension. Here's another case. This is a 32-year-old man with right shoulder pain, cough, and night sweats. Um, this prompted the radiologist to obviously look at the right shoulder, and there was a lytic destructive lesion there. This patient received a CT of the right shoulder, and you can see that there is an aggressive appearing lesion within the right scapula. There was initially thought to be a primary malignancy of the bone or an aggressive infection. The patient received the chest CT, and on the chest CT, we could see that there are, again, thin and thick-walled cysts solid and subsolid um, nodules in the upper lung zones. This may be confused with metastatic disease. However, this was a smoker and these findings are characteristic of pulmonary Langerhans cell histiocytosis. This patient received the bone scan as there is still some confusion as to what was going on in the bones. And we can see that there is just that single lesion in the right scapula. This underwent biopsy and the biopsy confirmed osseous Langerhans cell histiocytosis, which complicates about 10 to 15% of adult cases. The patient quit smoking in 2015 um, after they were diagnosed. In 2017, we could see that there has been improvement in the bony lesion. Notice that it was ill-defined and lytic, and now it has thin sclerotic margins. You could even see the cortex of the glenoid coming back, and that's also evident in follow-up CTs. Notice that the cortex is now intact, previously destroyed in 2015. 2017 is chest CT, again, demonstrates these areas of cystic change. Remember, the cysts are not going to go away. However, the thicker walled cavities and nodules have subsequently resolved. Here's case three, a 40-year-old female with a history of Sjogren's disease. We were asked to assess for an interstitial lung disease. On this person's CT, we can see that there are several cysts. However, different from the previous two cases is that these cysts are predominantly located in the lower lung zones. Here's our four axial CT representative images. Looking at these cysts as far as their shape goes, we do notice that several of the cysts have a small vessel running through the wall. So these cysts are described as being perivascular. Some of these cysts also demonstrated thin septations. So in summary, we have an oligocystic lung disease, several thin-walled cysts, some with septation, perivascular location that are lower lung zone predominant. In the setting of Sjogren's disease, these findings are highly characteristic of lymphocytic interstitial pneumonia. LIP is a benign lymphoproliferative disorder that can be associated with pulmonary lymphoma. It's commonly seen in some autoimmune diseases such as Sjogren's disease and rheumatoid arthritis, though it's also seen in the setting of HIV and Castleman's disease. However, the CT appearance between these two different uh, states um, is different. This can be progressive with some patients requiring lung transplant. However, the majority of cases of LIP often demonstrate oligocystic lung disease that is not typically severely progressive requiring lung transplant. This is different than what we saw with LI, with uh, LAM and PLCH, where those people's lungs can be entirely replaced with cystic change. That would be very unusual for LIP. On CT, we often see an oligocystic lung disease, predominantly in the lower lung zones, different from PLCH and LAM, that may be perivascular and sometimes associated with nodules. Ground glass is a, um, may be present, 
And then we could also see nodules that are central arbiter, tree and bud, or perilymphatic. It's important to note that autoimmune diseases like Sjogren's typically present with cystic lung disease with or without ground glass opacities and with or without uh, central arbiter nodules. Whereas people with immunodeficiency states usually don't present with cystic change. They usually present with perilymphatic micronodules or even tree and bud opacities, the follicular bronchiolitic form of LIP. Here's a 56 year old man with a history of Sjogren's disease. This person did have, again, lower lung zone predominant cystic lung disease that's oligocystic, um, uh, again, reflective of LIP. Notice when we look at these cysts, we can see that several cysts are associated with vessels running within the cyst wall, again, perivascular in location, characteristic of LIP. However, there was a lesion also seen in the lung here. He did have this part solid ill-defined lesion within his lingula that was subsequently followed. And in 2019, not only has the cystic lung disease actually progressed slightly in the lower lung zones, again, seeing that perivascular location of these cysts. However, this um, lesion now appears as an ill-defined mass-like area of consolidation with air bronchograms. This could have been an adenocarcinoma. And in fact, that's usually the most common cause that we see. However, in the setting of Sjogren's disease, you have to worry about pulmonary lymphoma, and this was confirmed to be pulmonary lymphoma um, and LIP occurring in the lung at the same time in someone with an autoimmune disease. Here's a 68-year-old female with a history of Sjogren's. This person has several cysts in their lung parenchyma. Again, lower lung zone predominant. Several of these cysts are associated with um, a perivascular location, lower lung zone predominant. This person also has some um, pretty unique features of LIP. When we blow up these cysts, we could see again the cyst wall. And within the cyst wall, we could see that there are nodules. It's with some of these nodules being calcified. In the setting of Sjogren's disease and LIP, these nodules typically reflect areas of nodular lymphoid hyperplasia or amyloid. If the nodules are calcified, these generally reflect amyloid, associated amyloidosis within the lung parenchyma. Here's another case of someone with LIP and a history of Sjogren's disease, the most common cause for LIP. We can see again that this person sort of has it all. They have several thin and thick walled cysts within the lower lung zones, predominantly lower lung zone predominant. Some of the cysts have nodules within the wall of the cyst itself, again, reflecting that nodular hyperplasia or amyloid. And we could also see that there are discrete nodules in the lung. These could be areas of nodular hyperplasia or amyloid, but you need to keep an eye on them as they could reflect areas of pulmonary lymphoma. There's no way to know that based on the imaging initial appearance. If they continue to grow, they may need to go under go biopsy. Lastly, this person does have ground glass opacities, another associated feature of LIP, particularly in the setting of connective tissue disease. And here's our last case, a 27-year-old man who was awoke from sleep with chest pain. Again, we could see a large pneumothorax. Again, spontaneous pneumothorax, we think of ruptured bleb, potentially cystic lung disease, as well as some other causes. This person did receive a chest CT after chest tube placement. And we could again see that this person does have several cysts predominantly within his lower lung zone. Again, it's an oligocystic lung disease. The intervening lung parenchyma here is normal. This is not good for LAM or PLCH as those are either diffuse or upper lung zone predominant. Although this, this appearance could be seen with LIP. So again, we can see that there are several cysts in the lower lung zones. However, there are some um, cystic changes here that are somewhat unique to this disorder. So we can see that these cysts have a, um, a ellipsoid or lenticular shape. So this ellipsoid or lenticular shape that's different than what we saw with LIP. We could also see that several of these cysts are associated with fissures as well as being adjacent to the pleural surfaces. So juxtaplural and perifissural in location with a lenticular shape. So we, again, we have an oligocystic lung disease that's lower lung zone predominant, which is similar to LIP. However, these cysts have a different shape. They're ellipsoid or um, lentiform in shape, and they're often located adjacent to fissures and pleural surfaces. This was a high confidence diagnosis of Bert Hogney Bay. This person did not have a connective tissue disease. Um, they underwent genetic testing in house and were found to be positive for the folliculin gene. So bird hog Bay is an autosomal dominant disorder that can be passed to children. It's thought to be rare, although it may just be underdiagnosed. It's a characteristically associated with a triad of pulmonary cysts, skin lesions reflecting fibrofolliculomas, as you can see in the neck here, these white bumps, as well as multiple and bilateral renal tumors, which can be both benign and malignant, particularly chromophobic RCC. 
On CT, we see a lower lung zone predominant cystic lung disease like LIP. And like LIP, this is often oligocystic. However, differentiating features include a lentiform or ovoid shape. These cysts are often juxtaplural or periphyseal. And occasionally, you may see just a single cyst with a thin septation, even septated. As in this case, this was a 39-year-old man with a single cyst in his lung. Uh, this wasn't even reported in the impression of the radiology report, only in the body. However, the pulmonologist noted this person did have a family history of renal cell carcinomas, found the cyst in the radiology report, and then sent the patient for genetic testing and was subsequently diagnosed with Berthog Dubain. Here's a 45 year old man with known bird hog dubai. Again, this person demonstrates characteristic features of a lower lung zone predominant oligocystic lung disease. These cysts again have a lentiform shape. We could also see that several of these cysts in this person were located adjacent to fissures. And again, notice that characteristic lentiform or ellipsoid shape. Here's a 74 year old woman with bird hog dubai prior nephrectomy for renal cell carcinoma and associated feature. We can see these characteristic lower lung zone oligocystic lung disease with juxtafissural or um, juxtapleural location. In the upper abdomen, we can see that the left kidney is absent, but on the right kidney, we could actually see that there was this enlarging hypoattenuating lesion confirmed to reflect a second renal cell carcinoma. This is why these people should be screened, and often we do screen them with MRI of the upper abdomen. This is also why it's important to make this diagnosis, as this is an autosomal dominant disease that is associated with um, development of renal cell carcinomas. So now let's review. So we identified that there were four cystic lung diseases that accounted for the majority of cases. These are LAM, PLCH, LIP, and Berthog Dubai. We looked at their distribution, shape, and associated findings to develop an approach. If we see upper low predominant cysts, we should be thinking about PLCH. If these cysts are diffuse involving the costophrenic angles as opposed to PLCH, which spares them, we should be thinking about lymphangiomyomatosis. And remember, LAM and PLCH are the two cystic lung diseases that can be severe. Lower lung zone predominant cysts we saw with LIP and Bird Hog Dubai. If you use just this distribution based approach, upper, diffuse, and lower, you'll be able to land on a confident diagnosis about 80 to 85% of the time. Then you can also look at the shape. Remember, the shape of PLCH cysts can often be bizarre. We could also look at the um, uh, shape of LAM cysts. These cysts are also, uh, often uniform in shape and regular in shape. So we can see just thin-walled cysts throughout the lung parenchyma. Perivascular shape um, cysts are associated with LIP. And then this juxtaplural or lentiform shape cysts are associated with Burkhag dubain And you can see that there are clear differences between the appearance of these cysts from each other. Then there were the associated findings that could be seen. PLCH is characteristically associated with smoking and emphysema. You could also see this characteristic progression on CT that often overlaps with each other. So you may see the presence of nodules, thin and thick walled cysts, and then these bizarrely shaped cysts. Remember the intervening lung parenchyma here is often abnormal. LAM on the other hand is associated with women, typically of childbearing years. You may see chylus pleural effusions. Here's an example of a severe cystic lung disease and a chylus pleural effusion associated with it. These lymphatic fluid collections. And then you could also see angiomyolipomas involving the kidneys, liver, retroperitoneum, or the posterior mediastinum. And then don't forget that LAM can be associated with tuberous sclerosis complex in men though. Remember, if you see something that looks like LAM in men, you should be thinking about tuberous sclerosis. For LIP, remember the associated finding here is Sjogren syndrome, and this can be associated with ground glass opacity in nodules. Berthog Dubay is typically a lower lung zone predominant cystic lung disease associated with a triad of cysts, fibrofolliculomas in the face and neck, and then don't forget about those renal cell carcinomas. So in conclusion, we identified the four most common causes of cystic lung disease, LAM, PLCH, LIP, and Bird Hug Dubay. We developed an algorithmic approach based on the distribution, upper, lower, or diffuse, and shape of cysts, as well as identifying associated findings, both clinical and radiographic, that can increase the confidence for a specific diagnosis. Thank you for your attention.